Hello again and welcome to another War of Water Game Imperial Guard Tactics video. Before we get into today's video, I would like to say a huge thank you to Richard, aka the Flute Master, for sending in some awesome pictures of his Talan army. Absolutely love this army and the, the historical basis that it's been built on, a combination of the British 8th Army with the 4th Indian Division and all sorts of bits and bobs have gone into it, so absolutely fantastic. Love the attention to detail. So thank you for this picture, Richard. If anyone else has got any cool pictures they want me to use in my videos, please head on over to my Facebook page or email them to me at morningglorytv at gmail.com and don't worry if you can't remember that, there will be links down to Facebook pages and email addresses down in the description below. But without further ado, let's get on with today's video. Now, in today's video, guys, I want to propose a new way of potentially running a combat guard horde army. So, the couple of ways that are fairly well known on how to run combat guard are, well, you can take cast chance because you get Strachan and you get the strength 4 everywhere and all the additional attacks thanks to Priest and Strachan and all this good stuff. And the other fairly well known way is from the greater good and that's when you take a combination of custom regiment traits which has been nicknamed, I think, not by me, by some of my subscribers, has been nicknamed the Slum Lords. And that's where you take Lords Approval and Slum Fighters together. And when you take that combination, you get quite a potent combat mix. Essentially, with Lords Approval, if you are within nine inches, not six inches, nine inches of a friendly regiment infantry officer, then your AP is straight away plus one. So your AP zero, lasgun, bayonets and rifle butts go up to AP minus one. That's pretty nice. Essentially, you get to give all your guardsmen like a Stardust chain swords. Can't go wrong with that. Uh, and then Slum Fighters is um, if you get a six to hit, it's an exploding hit six in combat. So if you get six to hit, you get two hits. That's pretty good. However, I want to put forward the proposal as just a bit of a quick tip tactica for another way of running your guard combat horde. You see, one of the big problems with both I would argue uh, Katachans and with Slumlords is that whilst they are great in combat, you have to get there, obviously, right? You have to get there. But if you're foot slogging it across the board, which you kind of need to do to get the numbers behind these kind of lists to, uh, to have some decent combat weight, then you're kind of relying upon move, move, move to get you where you want to go. And yeah, to be fair, in ninth edition, smaller board sizes, that can that can work, but it is still essentially relying on a couple of advanced roles to get you where you want to be. And if you have some bad adv advanced roles, then your army can easily, and I've seen this happen more often than not, I've seen armies get stranded out in the middle of no man's land or, st or have a bit of a false start, but a stuttering start, and they don't actually get that good first turn advance that they need and then it takes them a turn longer to get where they need to get to and they are cut down or they are countercharged by the enemy and it, it, the results are not pretty. The results are a lot of dead guardsmen. And at the end of the day, you can be really good in combat, but if you can't reliably solve the number one issue that every combat army since the dawn of 40k has faced, which is getting there, getting there on your terms, then it doesn't matter. And so... One thing I've been looking at is having a combination of, of going for slum fighters and agile warriors. I haven't decided whether to call these agile fighters or slum warriors yet. I think agile, fight, agile fighters sounds a bit too like an actual trait. So slum warriors I think is probably better. You can have the slum lords or the slum warriors. Now, what Agile Warriors lets you do is when infantry unit with this doctrine advances, you can re-roll the advanced roll. Now, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. And I believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that will affect both the dice roll for when you are rolling for advance in the movement phase, and you're also rolling to advance in uh, the move, move, move shooting phase. So if I am wrong there, I have scoured the internet. I can't see any evidence that that is incorrect. But if I am wrong... Please let me know down in the comment section and I'll always pin a comment to the top of the comment section to, uh, to confirm if I have made a mistake in the video. But let's go with the premise. Let's do, even, even, if you, even if you only get to do the re-roll, let's be conservative. You know, let's assume, let's err on the side of caution. Even if you only get to re-roll one of the advanced roles, that makes a huge difference. It makes a huge, huge difference. And 
what it means is that you're it, you're never going you're going to reliably be going a, as far as you need to go and you can move as far as you need to move um to get yourself up that board quickly and to try and guarantee that turn two charge one of the big things that people are, are complaining or loving depending on which side of the army you're on about drukari is those guaranteed turn two charges they're so good and th that's one thing that a lot of assault armies can struggle to deal with that's because a lot of people are taking assault infantry armies that don't always have the best way of getting into combat turn one or turn two sometimes you have to wait till turn three to get there um, that's why people love white scars so much because they can advance and still charge it's a really potent trait now we can't still advance and charge which means we have to if we're going to run a combat army and we're trying to get into the enemy as quickly as possible we have to try and get there by turn two every turn that we're out there is a turn that we're getting blasted and blasted hard which means realistically we only have one movement phase to get there and we need to make and that means we cannot afford if we're running combat guard can we afford i say i'm sort of i'm saying we cannot but i should i suppose i should phrase it as a question is it is we we you know i don't think i believe we cannot afford you know, do you think we can afford to not have that good turn or movement phase because i tell you if you if it takes you till turn three it doesn't matter how amped doesn't matter how much of a baby ogre in cash you are or how close your lord is and how, the roughest slum that you grew up in it is um if you are taking too long to get to the enemy you are getting scythed down as a guardsman it's just happening so why wouldn't we try and make sure we can get that turn one charge that turn two charge sorry and make the most out of that turn one movement phase i think it's really important i think it's really really important i, I mean if we go um if we go with the re-roll on the advance i believe the math hammer works out that you reliably get four inches with a re-roll on your advance roll please again i'm always open to people checking my math hammer and all that but let's say you let's let's err on the side of caution say so you only get to go the average the re-roll just allows you to keep that average well the average is 3.5 just let's make it easy let's say that's four there you go so four inches which means in your turn one, you're able to go 20 inches in movement. 20 inches. If you want to go that far, you don't necessarily have to go that far, but you've got 20 inches of movement to play with. You've got six inches movement, four inch advance, and then move, 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 six inches again, four inch advance. That's 20 inches. Now, most no man's lands in nearly every deployment board, most no man's lands in ninth edition, are 24 inches apart your deployment your distance apart is the same as always been it's just deployment zones which tend to be a lot smaller they can be closer than that though so if if your opponent is deployed right on the line right on the line then what that means is that of his deployment zone what that means is that you can go 20 inches forward now that means if he's a combat army he is going to get the drop on you which you may not want to go that far forward but if you're facing a shooting army or if you're trying to play the objective game then pushing loads of guardsmen up. I mean, you can get 11 orders in, or 10 orders in a basic guard army. Even if you're running just three company commanders and, and three platoon commanders, you can get nine orders. Then you can have the warlord trait that gives you an extra order. Then you can have laws of command, which gives you more orders. Then you can have uh, inspired tactics, which gives you more orders. But let's say you've got 10 guardsmen, 10, you get 10 orders off and you go for moving, moving all of them. That's a hundred guardsmen that you can just shove 20 inches forward. Now, what that means is, A, if you're facing a shooting army, then you've hemmed them in and you are going to get the charge on them next turn. Or if you're facing a take all comers army uh, and you don't mind the fact that you might get counter charged somewhat, then what you've done is essentially pinned the enemy into their deployment zone for an entire of turn one. That could deny them serious primary points. Bear in mind all your guardsmen objective secured. They are going to have to chew through a hundred guardsmen, which they probably can do in turn one and turn two. But they're going to have to chew through a hundred guardsmen, which means by the time that they break out of their own deployment zone, it's turn three. Now that's a big deal. 
That is a big deal. And bear in mind, you know, throwing 100 guys at the enemy is only about 500 points. You know, it's not, it's not a huge amount of your points. If you don't give them any upgrades, it's not a huge amount of your points. So if you imagine saying, I'm going to delay my opponent, I'm going to restrict my opponent for over a third of the game, for two fifths of the game, I'm going to hem my opponent into his deployment zone. He is missing out on primary at the beginning of his turn two and at the beginning of his turn three because it will take him one and two to break out and he won't, hopefully, you will have secured all the middle objectives by the time he's got through those 100 guardsmen suicide people that just charged forward and just got, you know, tried to bayonet charge down the enemy. That means you're securing those middle objectives. He's then got to try and push you off if you're running pure infantry guard. You're going to have another 100 to 150 guardsmen, which are now sat on the middle objective, sat on the home objectives. He's got to try and push you off those. It's taking him, turn to, it's taking him two turns to get to 100 guardsmen. That means he's, and then he's been taking damage this whole time. That means, has he got enough to push you off the primary? This way of running, and this is not just a concept, that we're using this Agile Warriors and Slumlords idea, but we're also talking about can guard in general just hem the enemy into their deployment zone? And I think the answer is yeah. I think we can really play this, this Harlequin game of corralling people in their deployment zone. I think we can do it. You know, some of the big armies out there are foot slogging armies. Drukhari, they're an exception. But if the Drukhari want to fly around and you know, expose themselves to your 100 sacrificial guardsmen turn one, you will then absolutely lasgun all those witches and all those other things to death. You'll lasgun raiders to death. Yeah, they're, they're tougher six now, so you win them on sixes, but you don't really care because they've only got like a four up save. Who gives a damn? You know, like any, any vehicle's got a four up save, it's going to get lasgun to death. <laughs> you know. So, my point is, you know, jokes aside, memes aside, you'll be hemming your opponent into the prompt zone. If they're lucky, let's be, let's be generous. Let's say that they, they get a, let's say they get a primary objective for turn two, turn three, turn four, turn five. That's only 20 primary points that they're getting. And there's a very good chance if you've bum rushed them with a hundred just brave, beautiful sons of bitches, bayonet boys, if you've just bum rushed them with a hundred bayonet boys, then then there's a good chance that you are obsecting their own objective for at least one of those turns. You might be getting your opponent down to, if they're lucky, scoring 15 primary points. But the point is, is that if you can, even if you can just restrict it so that they're only getting 20 primary points, that's less than half of the primary that they want to be scoring. That means, even if they max out all their secondaries, and that's a big if, that's a big if, even if they max out all of their secondaries, they're looking at at most 65 points in that game. 75 if you include the painting score. Meanwhile, you've definitely maxed out your primary. You could have maxed out your primary in three turns, two turns, two, three turns, sorry. Now you just go up to 45 primary, nice and easy. Then you've probably been raising the banners on at least three objectives. So you're going to have max. So you're already on 45 points. You're already on 45 points. Then all you have to do is max out, raise the banners. You're on 60 points. You're on 60 points. They are on 65 points. So all you have to do is get six other secondary objective points and you'll win that game. You know, painting score for both sides taken into account. Because they get 20, even if they're lucky, they'll get 20 for primary. If they're really lucky, they'll max out the secondaries. So you're looking at 65 points for them in total, not including painting score. For you, you've sat on the primary. You've sat on the primary for the whole game, which means you only have, and if you max out banners, you only have to pick up six of the primary, uh, six of the sec secondary points. I mean, that is, that is, you, you know, you are capping what they can achieve. You are limiting what they can achieve. At most, they're looking at, 75 points, but really, really, realistically, I tend to find that most people score, um, most people aim to score 10 secondary victory points per secondary. So if you're limiting them to 20 primary victory points and then you limit them to 30 secondaries, that's 50 points that they're getting. That's 50 points. You, if you play the primary game right, you've almost equaled them just on primary score. And then all you need to do is pick up a few cheeky banners, a few cheeky engagement fronts, and you're having a great time.
You're having a great, great time. So I think the way that this list works and this concept works is that you just you are you are denying the enemy primary points. You're hemming them into their deployment zone. And I think it could be a really powerful tactic. I mean, one thing that I'm gonna be looking at in the future in another video is guard soup. You know, why wouldn't you take one detachment of conscripts with or maybe not conscripts because of the order thing, but one detachment of guardsmen or two detachments of guardsmen in this configuration and then have a third detachment of of wilderness survivor guys, agile shooter guys, that's with full of infantry and veteran squads. And you end up having 200 blokes or 120 infantry that you throw at the enemy, sacrifice them. By the time the enemy breaks through from that, they've got another 100 guardsmen, which are sat on all the, pri all the other primary objectives. They're on a four up save all the time because of cover, because of uh, wilderness survivors. I think it's a really potent uh, combination. So we've covered a few different things here, but we've covered it through the lens of looking at this agile fighter trait. So it's a bit of a two for one, this video, this whole corralling idea backed up by this whole, how's the best way to do it? Well, if you're gonna corral the enemy, you wanna make sure you get those reliable advance roles. Agile fighters, agile warriors, agile fighters, slum warriors, whichever you prefer. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. If you've got a better name for that regiment combination, I would love to hear it. Has anyone tried this tactic? I'm going to be trying it out. I am going to be trying it out sooner rather than later. The la final bits of the battle bunker are coming together. The UK is, fingers crossed, heading out of lockdown. I'll be able to have some great battles in the battle bunker soon. Speaking of the battle bunker and the other Patreon-supported projects that I have going on the channel, if you have liked this video and you want to support the channel further, please consider heading on over to the Patreon page. I'm very transparent with the whole Patreon thing. All the money that I receive gets reinvested back into the channel and I use it to fund things like going to tournaments. Thanks to the Patreon support, I've been able to sign up to five, no, six tournaments now, including the London Grand Tournament, thanks to the Patreon support. And I use that money to go to tournaments, to build the Battle Bunker, which is the new incoming YouTube studio. And both of those things allows me to A, stay on the cutting edge of the meta by going to events and facing down some of the worst lists possible with my humble guardsmen, and B, things like the Battle Bunker allow me to bring really high quality battle reports to you guys, um, which I'm really, really looking forward to unveiling. It's all come together, it's so close, the last delivery is gonna be arriving tomorrow. But if you wanna head on over to the Patreon page, there's a link down in the description below. There's no minimum, there's no maximum, there's none of this. If you pay me $20, you can chat to me and all this kind of rubbish. Don't, I don't believe in that. It's just, if you wanna support the channel, that's one way of doing it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and of course, thank you for watching.